playing for the American League Championship. I don't believe it. It just continues. My oh. High fly ball into right field. She is gone. Oh, drives one. Right field. Did he do it? He did. Are you kidding me? Hey, it's an SEC final in the College World Series. LSU and my pick, Florida, get it going Saturday, late afternoon. I think that's a 4 p.m. Eastern start. What a run of games it's been. I think that classic between LSU and Wake Thursday, people are going to remember that one for a long time. It ended the number one team season in 11 innings, a ridiculous pitching duel between two first-round arms. Braden Taylor's drive in the TCU-Florida game, uh, Florida Ooh. advanced despite the fact that all the data tells us this was a great thing I saw on Twitter that Taylor's long out to center field would have been a hit in every big league stadium. Just uh wow. Happy weekend, everybody. This is the FSS plus podcast alongside Joe Doyle. I'm Jason Churchill. Joe, when Taylor hit that ball, the first thing I thought yeah. was, Oh my goodness. He did it. This is what he a did great, it. <laughs> like it was a great ending anyway, but wow. Did you think it was gone when he hit it? I thought it was, I thought it was eighth row. I mean, I thought it was way, way gone. So, um, yeah, man, that <laughs> the, the college baseball, the last what 72 hours has been sick. Gosh, I mean, I can't think of a better representation for college baseball. I, I've, I've, I told you this on, on previous episodes. I feel like college baseball is taking some pretty sizable steps to the casual baseball fan over the last couple of years. And man, this college baseball season has really done wonders for the sport. Absolutely. Let, let, let's just say this way. If you listen to this show or any podcast and you just happen to be catching this one on, maybe you clicked on this on accident. If you just like baseball and you like environments, and that's one of the things, Joe, that draws me to college football is the environments. Like I was at a game at, 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 uh, in Columbus, uh, to see Ohio State and Wisconsin. What an amazing environment. I saw Penn State on a whiteout day. What an amazing day. Like Ames, Iowa, amazing environments. College baseball brings it when it comes to the environments. And when you get to the regionals, the super regionals, the College World Series itself, everything just takes a step up. Uh, you're right. That that was what a display of incredible competition between athletes and teams. And, and the crowd always brings it. Uh, in Omaha, so man, that was you know what I've, that was pretty incredible. You know what I've enjoyed. You know what I've enjoyed this for this playoffs, man. Like, I think you get a lot of college baseball playoffs where there's a lot of really interesting teams: the Coastal Carolinas, the Oral Roberts, the, mm. the Wingates, the Belmont. You know, there's always a lot of interesting teams that are always mixed in, and it feels like most years you have a good smattering of pro prospects. Mm. Every single team in this tournament, the last. You know, final 16 teams, maybe with the exception of Oral Roberts, but Kay Denton is a dude. Mm -hmm. um, Denton is a dude, the, yep. Yeah, I mean, every single team seems to have at least one top 50 player. And the, I think the coolest part has been like, if you're a pro baseball fan and you're really into the draft and that's kind of what's bringing you into college baseball, these stars have starred out mm -hmm. like through and through it's been really fun to watch yeah so now you're in the final it's lsu florida all sec final but just like what you were just saying you get dylan cruz you get paul Skeens, you get tommy white you get all these these uh these prospects for lsu that we've been talking about for months but also florida not only has prospects for this year but some big time elite guys for next year but might we get a paul Skeens hurston waldrop matchup is that I didn't look at the the schedule when the last time those guys threw, but if we get that matchup, that's a matchup you're not going to want to miss. If you like baseball at any level, that's a matchup you are absolutely not going to want to miss. Uh, absolutely incredible. That's a really good. Uh, it's a really good point, Joe. Um, yeah, draft prospects galore. It's incredible. That's I don't know if it can. Can it top Paul Skeens versus Rhett Louder? Like. That was I one mean, of the does, best can the, pitching matchups like the I've matchup ever seen. is very similar, but can the performance, can the actual game, and and how entertaining that was, can it get better than that? Probably not. I think so, man, that it's was been, incredible. It's been really that cool. Was, yeah. All right, we're gonna chat draft and only draft in this episode. We are sixteen days out 
in the 2023 Major League Baseball draft. Now, the draft is a three-day kind of endeavor, so to speak. I don't even want to call it an event. It is like day one is an event. Day two and day three, those are endeavors. <laughs> uh, you have to have some serious uh, endurance to sit through those and, and, and to do that. And Joe, you and I have done this for years. Uh, fun, interesting. Uh, one of the things I've been thinking about of late, Joe, is if I am team blank, what am I hoping happens in front of me? And I'm hoping we can play that game with a few clubs uh, in this episode here. Uh, one team in the top five in particular. Uh, also, I want to ask about the floor of a particular college bat. And there is a really, to me, a polarizing talent in the top 10 or 20 that I want to talk about. We're going to get to that in this episode. And it's not because just by himself, it's the profile that's polarizing. So that's what we're going to do. Draft, draft, and more draft in this episode of the FSS Plus podcast. Let's start out with the team thing, Joe. Like if if I'm, let's start with number five. If I am the Minnesota Twins at number five, obviously I'd love if Dylan Cruz or Paul Skeens fell to me. Probably really not all that realistic. That's probably best case scenario. But if, you, if you're sitting in the Twins front office and you're putting together draft boards and you're thinking about scenarios and you eliminate the highly unlikely, what is it that you're hoping happens for you in the top four as you sit there at number five waiting for that pick to come? I mean, I think if I am the general manager of the Twins, I'm obviously hoping that one of Max Clark, Walker Jenkins, one of those is there. I, mm. I'm assuming they're going to be there. If I'm the Twins, any one of those first five players is going to be a great option. Now, that, that being said, mm. I've said before that I, I do think this is a deeper draft in terms of high school bats. And so I don't think you can eliminate the idea of, well, I know the Twins have the fourth most amount of dollars to spend. What if they went a little under slot here? You know, what if they were like, ah, what if we just want to spend a little bit more in the second round and a little bit more in the third round and really take advantage of the upper tier of this mm -hmm. high school class? What if the twins were to look at this and say, why don't we do Nolan Shanuel or Chase mm -hmm. Davis really mm -hmm. cheap? Let me play you one Mitchell right really kind of in the middle cheap. of that. Let me, let me play one fun. right in the middle of that, Joe. Uh, how about Matt Shaw? So he's probably not quite Nolan Shanuel when it comes to saving. But at five... You probably could save a little bit on Matt Shaw. Like maybe not really a great you might probably not save two so, million dollars, yeah. but you could probably shave a million off that that slot and get a guy like that who the twins do like college bats. Um, they are gonna have some, if you look at organizational needs, not that that's a major part of why you'd go Shaw here, but he does fill an organizational need. You have Brooks Lee, Matt Shaw probably moves to second base or third base. Brooks Lee probably moves to second base or third base, but I think early on. Brooks Lee's going to be able to play shortstop, but right now they have Carlos Correa anyway. So if you just fill that infield uh, or that roster, that organization, your farm system with college bats that are close, like proximity has value here, especially the Twins are a competitive team and leading the American League Central, the terrible mm -hmm. American League Central. What about Matt Shaw? Does that fit? You know, it's kind of funny that we bring up this conversation today. The day that Nick Gonzalez is, is promoted, I, I kind of look at Matt Shaw as – how much different is he than, first of all, how much different is what Nick Gonzalez has turned into mm -hmm. different than what Matt Shaw is? I think Matt Shaw is going to be a better hitter. I don't think there's any doubts. And the numbers kind of bear that out in terms of like who they were in, in college mm -hmm. as college players. But Nick Gonzalez really kind of turned into a power second base left field type of a profile. And I think that's what Matt Shaw could be. And I tell you what, if you can get Matt Shaw at five and save I don't know. You can throw out the number 1.2 million and really set yourself up for some high profile high school talent in the second and third mm -hmm. round. I think that's an absolutely fantastic way to go about this draft. Yeah. Nick Gonzalez, by the way, the Pirates pick in uh, 2020, uh, never really did uh, other than down in uh, uh, high A ball a couple of years ago when he was 22 years old. Never really did show the big power. I slug in 450 and 57 games in AAA as a as a 24 year old. I'm not really sure he's what I'd call a power hitter. But you're right from a yeah. second base perspective. If you're yeah. going to get a guy who slugs 430, 440. I mean that's going to play. That's some some pretty decent impact. Matt Shaw seems to have a little bit better like raw power 
No. Like when you when I watch Agreed. that swing, oh, I question. see easier yeah. leverage. I see more raw power than Nick Gonzalez. Yeah. I think that was the worry with better. Gonzalez. You remember played in New Mexico oh, yeah. and the ball travels. That's not the case with Matt Shaw. I remember he hit a home run at New Mexico, and I I could have my numbers wrong, but I want to say it was forty three degrees. Like not not the temperature. <laughs> like the launch angle was forty three <laughs> degrees, and it went out. And, a, and so everyone did kind is. of question. Can this kid hit when he's not at elevation? I think Matt Shaw is going to hit for more contact than Nick Gonzalez. I think Matt Shaw is going to hit for more power than Nick Gonzalez, and uh, I, I just think overall he's he's a good he's a he's a good player. He's a good bat, and either you know the bat plays at second base, it plays in left field, it plays at either one of those positions. You know, so many scouts will tell you at the start just draft hitters. Like, don't worry about it. unless they are a designated hitter to start with. Just draft hitters, and you'll figure out the rest later. Yeah, usually takes care of it for you. Um, so if I'm the Twins, yeah, uh, I guess I'm hoping for a shot at one of those top four players, Langford, Clark, Skeens, Cruz, and maybe throw in a, a fifth one in Jenkins. One of those guys is going to be there. Um, but you could go the the underslot play and and do something a little bit later as well. Or Braden Taylor. Uh, He's a left-handed hitting third baseman with go. power. He showed well in, in the playoffs. I mean – that's kind mm-hmm. of been the profile that they have targeted for the majority of the last six or seven years. Right. It is with the twins. Um, some of these clubs are obviously a little bit more, I don't want to say predictable, but more predictable than others. Like we can see trends. Some clubs have recent changes yeah. in the front office where we really don't know what they're going to do. Some clubs are a little bit all over the map. Um, the twins are somewhat predictable. I think we have an idea yeah. what they'd like to do. Uh, in a position like this can be really interesting to see what happens. All right. So moving down the draft a little bit um, from uh, from the twins at number five, when you take a look at um, somewhere in the middle of the first round, one of the teams that's really interesting here uh, to me, Joe, is the, the Chicago White Sox. Uh, and they pick at number 15. Now I've seen some mocks. I think your latest mock had, uh, had them taking Jacob Wilson. Uh, I've heard them link to a ton of guys does how much does you know in your mind does if you're Ken Williams and Rick Hahn here like what in the world are we doing with our major league roster at the deadline this year how much does that come into play when you're thinking about the draft because you have an, you're going to have an opportunity to take some college guys you know, Wilson Jacob Gonzalez maybe Matt Shaw gets there um uh you know guys like that but if you're going to tear down that roster perhaps and sell some pieces and do a quick, you know, kind of a re uh, kind of a retool and maybe have a step back year or two. Are, are you really worried that, you know, in that situation, might you value proximity ETA a little bit less? Yeah. The white Sox are, are going to be one of the toughest teams to, to kind of figure out. I don't know if the trade deadline is necessarily the, is necessarily the linchpin as much as it is just Rick on and, and, and Williams looking in the mirror and saying, is this team going to compete in 2024? Like, are we going to tear this thing down? Are, are we going to have jobs in 2024? <laughs> if we're worried about having our jobs, you know, should should Rhett Louder be the pick here if he's here at 15? Mm-hmm. Should should Hurston Waldrop be the pick here if he's here? Do we need someone that's going to contribute in 2024? Do we need reinforcements right away? Or are we going to, you know, are we going to lose our jobs? Mm-hmm. Could Enrique Bradfield fit here? Because he's going to be a, you know, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but he's going to be a reasonably quick mover, I would think. Mm-hmm. I think if you're Rick Hahn, you need to make the decision of selecting the player that's going to be best for the organization long term. Uh, And maybe that's a college player. Maybe that's a high school player. And I know I'm not specifically answering your question, but I think that organization could go in any number of directions over the next 18 months. And so I think what what Rick Kahn has to do is just, he has to do his due uh, due diligence and make a smart, sound decision, regardless of whether or not he's going to be making that same draft pick in 2024. So if you're the White Sox, it's granted, it's 14 picks. You're never going to be able to predict that. We're not going to be able to predict that. The White Sox aren't going to be able to predict that either. Not one through 14 every single pick before their you know time comes, before they're on the clock. But if you're kind of just generally you know speaking, you know if you get to dictate what happens in front of you if you're the White Sox, are you thinking like, boy, I hope you know, uh, I hope some of these teams ahead of us uh, you know, go the prep route because we want to go the college route or, you know, in, in building off of what you said, 
whatever is best for the organization long term. And you don't really know which direction you're going to go to the rest of this season or next season and whether you think you can win this season or next season. Like that probably does have to come into play. But are you sitting there kind of thinking, you know, hey, you know, I'd really like to get some high upside, you know, talent in this organization. I know they did that a little bit with uh, with a couple of recent picks. Or if you're sitting there thinking, man, we need some help. Like we need a shortstop in, in our system. We need because Tim Anderson's deal uh, is up soon. Uh, we don't have a lot of athletic outfielders in the system or we need more arms to replenish. Are you just kind of sitting there thinking, man, I, I hope one or two of these college arms, you know, get to us or one of these two, you know, uh, college bats that play the middle infield, like Tommy, Troy, Matt Shaw, get to us. Is there anything like that, any narrative like that, that you can kind of tie to if you're sitting there as the White Sox at 15? I mean, if I was the White Sox, I would be looking at athletes. You and I have talked Mm -hmm. about this for a couple of years now. The biggest issue with that lineup is just there's, (laughs) I'll just say what I texted you. There's a lot of pudding cups, you know, Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of guys that you just put out (laughs) at a position and they can't play any other position. And the position <laughs> you're playing them at, they're not particularly good there either. So they need to make uh, some trades. They need to completely rebuild, mm-hmm. retool this roster. There's enough talent in the White Sox organization, even at the big league level, to mm-hmm. replace some of the slugging archetypes for more of the athlete archetypes. And I think you can find those guys that are close to the big league. I, I've said this since, since, what, January or February? I personally think Enrique Bradfield is the perfect fit for this for this lineup. You mm-hmm. you get speed, you get on base ability, you get some sort of dynamic ability on the base pass. You take some pressure off of Luis Robert, who has had some some lack of focus and boneheaded mistakes in center field, albeit an extremely talented player in center field. You know his body gets beat up from having to cover all of that room that Eloy Jimenez can't cover and Gavin Sheets can't cover. I think he is the perfect fit for what this team is lacking. And I, I think he also checks the box of, you know, maybe he's a guy that can contribute to the Chicago White Sox in 2025 when that window should still be open if they're willing to, you know, supplement some of uh supplement some pitching into this organization with the losses, with the presumed losses of Lance Lynn and Lucas Giolito and some of these guys that are coming to the end of their contracts. I think maybe and maybe it goes back to that, Joe, if you're the White Sox. Do we think we can put together a legitimately competitive starting rotation with Lance Lynn coming to the end of his contract and Julia to being a free agent as well? Do we think we can either keep one or both of those guys and add to that and get to the point where we have one of the better rotations, one of the better two or three rotations, at least in our division? Because that Cleveland uh, situation isn't exactly uh, static either. There's rumors they might shop Shane Bieber. Um, Mm -hmm. They obviously have offensive woes there. Minnesota's put together some good stuff there. But if you're looking forward to next season, I mean, Sonny Gray's a free agent. Tyler Malley's going to be out. Kenta Maeda's a free. Like, there's an opportunity there if you're Chicago. So it might just come down to what you just said about the rotation at the big league level. Can we put together a competitive rotation? If the answer is yes, maybe that does change a little bit about uh, how they go about Let's building ask this, this question uh, this also. craft in 2023. Can we spend? You know, they, they need to have an idea. <laughs> so I'm dead ass serious. On July 9th, do we they know need to the, know. Do we know the answer to that question in the big picture? I think we yes. Do. In the big picture. But in the short term? They're not really going to spend. But there's a lot right. coming off the do we think? Do we think a pitcher is going to, you know, are, do we think they're going to shell out another $70 million deal this winter? You know, maybe they pray that Rhett Lauder, maybe they pray that teams look at the ceiling of Rhett Lauder and they mm-hmm. say, maybe this is just a tick better than Mike Leak. Maybe, you know, maybe this is only a number three and look at what Colin Houck could be. Look at what Blake Mitchell could be. You know, mm-hmm. maybe they say, ah, God, I kind of hope that Rhett Lauder falls to 15 and a plug and play type guy that can contribute next year because we're just simply not sure if we're going to have the wallet to go out and make some of these additions that that we'd like to make this offseason with some of these better pitchers coming off the book. The White Sox are, man, We, you and I talked about this with Seattle in 2018 when we used to talk about this. That It, it is such a bad place, that no man's land, where, where Seattle is. had mm-hmm. Nelson Cruz and Robinson Cano and a beat-up James Paxton and Felix Hernandez, Felix Hernandez was getting older and declining. Career. And they had absolutely nothing on the farm. And so I think that's just kind of where Chicago is. It's like, you know, we don't have a lot coming uh, and we don't have a lot of pitching that can supplement this team in the near term. So I think we just got to take the best player available that can get here quickly. There 
2023 payroll is about 190 million dollars give or take they have 108 million committed for next season um so grandal uh, his uh, deal comes off the books uh, we mentioned giolito uh lance lynn situation it has a 2024 option and a one million dollar buyout so there's a bunch of money uh coming off the books or potentially uh coming off the books andrews uh is a free agent at the end of the season um uh, I'm missing somebody. Oh, Tim Ronaldo Anderson Lopez got one more year. Uh, Tim Anderson has uh, an option, so he had 23 option and 24 option for tw- uh, 12 and a half million dollars. So they're going to pick that up. They might trade him, Team but they're going to okay. pick that up. So really interesting situation there in in uh, in Chicago, where the draft is just one of the things that comes up uh, in that conversation. Uh, one more team in the draft where I, I'm kind of sitting around, and this is a team that uh, the two of us have covered for years. The Seattle Mariners have picks 22, 29, and 30. If you're just looking at the bucket of picks 1 to 21, is there a narrative or two that stands out to you where you're just thinking, if you're Seattle at 22, you're thinking, if we can get this to happen in front of us, we're going to be set. This is what we want to happen. I, I still think, and I know that you don't value him quite as much as I do, but I still think if Tommy Troy is on the board at 22, that checks every box that the Mariners would probably target in this mm-hmm. in this class and also the shortcomings of the organization as a whole right now. They mm-hmm. don't have a second baseman. They don't have a second baseman that's reasonably close to the to the big leagues i mean cole young is probably the next in line and he you know that's september 2025 i would say um and i think tommy troy could beat him there you know for a team that is starved for offense i just think tommy troy or matt shaw i think they're very similar players Mm -hmm. i just think they check just about every box that the organization currently lacks. If either of those guys gets the 22, I'm absolutely on board. I'm just not quite as high on Tommy Troy as some seem to be. There's some out there that are like, this guy's a top seven guy, and I'm just not there with Tommy Troy. I understand if you're just trying to pick a player, and I just don't do it that way. I don't look at prospect rankings that way. I don't look at the draft that way. I'm not just trying to pick the the best player that I'm almost sure is getting to the big leagues. I'm not doing that. I'm thinking I'd rather take a 25% risk at a 60-grade player then have a 75% chance at a 50 grade player. That's kind of the way I think of it when I think about the draft. So I know not everybody does, but just generally yeah, speaking, that's, right. that's the way I like I, guess I like you Tommy and I Troy. Vary, I guess we vary just a little bit because I see a lot of Brian Dozier in Tommy Troy. And I think, you know, I, maybe Brian Dozier was a tick better uh, glove and his glove was not good. Uh, but Tommy Troy's faster. He'll probably slow down because he's a really big kid. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, Brian Dozier was a, a roll 55 guy, probably a roll six guy at his peak. Yeah. Yep. And that's probably Tommy. That's a really good, uh, uh, really good one for Tommy. Troy. It, my, I still have questions of whether he can play second base every day, long term, too. We yeah. just didn't get to for, see yeah, for him sure. do that a lot. I know he played shortstop in high school and a little bit at Stanford, but he played third base all year. We didn't really get to see him do those things around the bag. I'm not saying he can't do it. I'm saying there are some questions, at least for me. And that plays into it as well. But if he's there at 22, all day, all day. Yeah, here's the question. If you're Seattle and somehow, some way, some weird stuff happens and Tommy Troy and Matt Shaw are there at 22 and they're both slot signings, who do you favor? Are you a Troy guy or are you a Shaw guy? Yeah, that. I mean, that's eye of the beholder. I, I mm-hmm. think they're so similar. Tommy Troy's a little bit faster. Matt Shaw might have a half tick in the glove department. Neither mm-hmm. one of them can really throw uh, – Maybe Tommy Troy's got an average arm. If if yeah, if you're being right. kind, I think it's probably a bit fringier. But I think it might ultimately come down to the swing. You know, Tommy Troy is more of a grooved, you know, prototype picturesque swing, whereas Matt Shaw's got the enormous leg kick and he loads into the back hip, kind of like what Eric Brown Jr. did last year. So maybe it just comes down to uh, teams, you know, uh, siphoning it all the way down to the biomechanics side of their PD and, and, you know, giving them the pick. So you just hope if you're Seattle, you're kind of hoping for one of those college infielders, even if it's Braden Taylor at 22, it's like Shaw, Tommy Troy, Braden Taylor. Is there another one that you're hoping gets to you at 22? Not somebody that's a backup plan, but somebody that you're not really sure gets to you at 22, but you think there's at least an outside shot. So you're kind of sitting there hoping that's the way it unfolds in front of you. I mean, I think, 
what's not being said, like the elephant in the room here is probably Jacob Wilson. Uh, that's the only other guy that really fits into this in this block. I think if you're Seattle and you have three picks in the first round and you have the financial flexibility to really make this a a valuable class, I think you probably stay away from the Jacob Wilson, what is the high floor, lower ceiling pick yep. at 22, yep. Uh, yep. especially because, you know, just because he's a high floor, low ceiling guy does not mean, especially at 22, does not mean you're going to get him under slot. I would be stunned if you got him under slot at 22. You might have to mm-hmm. go over slot like the Reds did with Matt McClain at 17 a couple of years ago. So I think for a, for Seattle, for a team that values uh, exit velos, like it seems that front office has tended to uh, refer to more and more over the last couple of years. I don't think he really fits their archetype, but um, I, you have to lump him into that same bucket. Yeah. So we we talked about um, uh, Enrique Bradfield Jr. just a minute ago. You did. You brought him up. You mentioned him with the White Sox, how he fits there. To me, as we finish this up today, his, and it's not really the player himself that fascinates me, although he does, because it, that's a, it's a pretty darn good athlete that can do a lot of things on the field. Um, but we're talking about what an 80 runner, at least a 70 runner, probably an 80 runner, at least a yeah. 70 defender in center, maybe even maybe yeah. even an 80 defender ultimately. That and he can actually steal bases. He's not just a fast guy. He actually gets a what he still like 130 bases at Vandy. Um, just absolutely crazy. Caught just uh, 12 or 13 times, I believe it was, and he was perfect. Like he was 100 percent, like 45. It was 46, 46 for 46 last season. I mean, this is a, was a base pick-off. dealer, right? A base dealer, a, a base runner, and and he puts that speed to play at a premium position in the middle of the field and center. The reason he's kind of polarizing, maybe that's not the best word. The, the reason this is really interesting to me, the profile and where he goes and and how teams look at him, this is truly a, be, a, a eye of the beholder kind of situation. Offensively, just as a bat, Enrique Bradfield is not a top 100 pick. Like when you read, when you hear and you talk and I'm reading through my texts and people are like, yeah, you know, this is a guy who like, you know, at the back end of his swing, he's a power hitter, but everything else suggests he's Willie Wilson. He's going to hit the ball in the gap and run to daylight. Like there's a big stride and, and, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of room for drifting and and gliding and things like that. And, and, uh, you know, he's not a big guy. Um, probably wiry strong, would you say, Enrique Bradfield yeah, Jr.? This is just a really word. interesting profile here, Joe. And I just think, you know, I've seen him, you know, in the top 10. I've seen him fall as as far as like 17, 18, 19, you know, uh, on some people's boards and, and, and some of the public ones that are out there in the mock drafts. But like this is, for me, this is a difficult guy to figure out. I think this is a pretty, despite the fact that he's a three-year uh, college player, this is a difficult guy for me to you know toss an eval on like no matter how much information i get no matter how much data is there i look at the stats i look at well you know he did it 14 home runs you know over the past couple of years so there's at least gap power well yeah and that is in the sec yeah well i'm not sure that projects i'm just really not and we're not talking about a guy who went out and hit 430 in the sec so he's not a hit tool get on base a ton steal a bunch of bases guy necessarily at this point lots of questions but it's difficult to watch him even just the, you know, watch him ground out to second base. It's difficult to watch him and not go, huh, I think I might be able to do something with this guy. Uh, for I mean, listen, Ronald Acuna Jr. is on pace for 70 stolen bases. Baseball is changing. <laughs> 70. Yeah. When's the last time mm-hmm. we saw that? 15, 20 years? I mean, Ooh, that, that's a good it's question. been a long time. Yeah. Been a mm-hmm. long time. So I, I look at that and I say, if, if, teams are really embracing the bigger bases and trying to develop these new base running models. I think you kind of have to take a look at Bradfield and just go, the guy stays inside the zone. He doesn't chase, makes a Mm -hmm. lot of contact. I think he was a little bit unlucky with, with BABIP this year. And maybe that was, you know, ground balls and weak fly balls, but in an, in a season, in a, in an era where stolen bases are at an all time high, at least in the in the most recent uh, history, mm-hmm. and at a time when it seems as though so many teams have foregone athleticism in the outfield in exchange for just thump, he's a bit of a throwback, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I think a lot of people want to say that this is going to be Kenny Lofton, and if he's Kenny Lofton, 
kudos. But even if it, even if this is peak Gerard Dyson, Gerard Dyson mm-hmm. for three or four years was a, an all-star really level center yeah. fielder, really good, really good player. Mm-hmm. I think for me, he's the thirteenth best player in the class. I think you're going to expunge more value out of him than you actually probably think, just based on his scouting report. And even if this guy hits, like, like if if we were doing a Seattle lean, imagine if JP Crawford was the exact same player that he is, maybe even a little bit better defender, except. Mm-hmm he was stealing 50 bases a year. Yeah, like, that's a different, it's a different guy. It's, it's, a totally it's an different entirely guy. different, yeah. it's an entirely different mm-hmm. player and it's up the middle of the field. If I'm, you know, for, if I'm Miami, I think it's a perfect fit. I think it's a great pick. Is he potentially Jacoby Ellsbury? That's the last guy to steal 70 bases in a major league season, by the way. Jacoby Ellsbury in 2009 stole 70. Uh, two years before that years. in the National League, it was Jose Reyes stealing 78. So yeah, it's been a while. The last time someone stole 60, well, D. Strange Gordon did it in 2017. So it hasn't been quite that long. But 70, once you get to 70, you have to go back all the way to 2009. So it, it brought me to the name Jacoby Ellsbury. And I'm thinking, I remember Ellsbury in college. Saw him a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, were there's, are there some similarities? Uh, there's some. I, I think Bradfield has maybe wiry strong on his side there. Like there may be more upside there when like, please create some leverage. Ellsbury though, did start to hit for power. He got a couple of years into his career, had a couple of big years at the plate, hitting the ball out of the ballpark. Is this kind of sort of the idea we're talking about here out in center field, playing elite defense, stealing 70 bags a year, and maybe having some years where he hits 15, 20, 25 home runs. I think that's, I think that's the profile. I like the D strange Gordon thing. Enrique Bradfield jr. Has bat speed. He has an arm mm-hmm. bar that's holding him back from actually, you know, showing it in games, but he's sure. shown big exit velos. Like, I think he's a guy that can be, and I wrote this in my report. I think he's a guy that could be eight to 12 home runs routinely every year, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. 40 to 50 to 60 home runs per year. If you give him 600 plate appearances, uh, the Jacoby Ellsbury thing is great. And Jacoby Ellsbury was a lean, wiry, lanky kid who, you know, mm-hmm. it, it took until he was 25 to, to start hitting for power. And I think that's what you could see here. Yeah, you know, um, it, I, I'm not saying they're the same player, but when Corbin Carroll, who's actually from my my neck of the woods, from our neck of the woods up here, uh, Joe, um, the the book on him was this guy's going to drive baseballs, but this is a 40 doubles, 12 to 16 homers, uh, tons of contacts, steal 50, 60 bases. Like that's the kind of player this guy is. Not a 30 homer guy. But let me tell you something right now, Joe. And you know this well. But I'm just gonna like he's Corbin Carroll's in his rookie season. He's played 73 games as up to this very moment. He has 299 plate appearances. Corbin Carroll has 16 home runs. Now, granted, he's playing his games at Chase. Okay. I understand the ball travels fairly well there. Okay. I, I completely get it. But this is a guy who's, you know what? 5'10 and 175 pounds. Like sometimes it ain't about size, is it? Like you generate bad speed, you know how to uh to make contact and create leverage, get that backspin going. Like you're gonna hit the ball hard and far. And if you're already telling me, Joe, that Bradfield does hit the ball hard and has that kind of bad speed, this sounds like this could be a kid that's one quick fix away from that swing from being exactly that. From being yeah. basically more Corbin Carroll than anything else. And he's got I I I start with this. In every report, he's got the approach. It's like an eleven percent chase rate, you know. And mm-hmm. and for a guy that leads off every game, he leads off every game. There's not a lot of thumpers behind him this year at Vanderbilt. He mm-hmm. took his pitches. He worked, you know, patient at bats. He got on base. Yeah, he didn't make solid contact night in and night out, but he never lost his approach. And I think uh, I think the power will come as he continues to get reps. Really interesting. Uh, by the way, Corbin Carroll has eight home runs at home and eight home runs on the road. So it's not Love just about kid. his home ballpark. And he's not a big dude. But yeah, no. interesting. Enrique Bradfield Jr. going to be really interesting to see uh, where he goes. Joe, we're almost two weeks out. Like like Again, as I hit the red button today, 16 days from the draft. It has gone by fast. And we're going to have to, let's see, how many more shows do we have? We're going to have, we're going to have two more shows and then we'll have something after the draft, of course, uh, to talk about and kind of recap. It could be a long episode. This might be a, it might be a buckle up episode of, of the podcast, but uh, we'll talk again next week. 
Um, I'm going to, by the way, next week, I'm going to ask Joe about trading competitive balance picks. I can, I keep getting the question. Joe, you and I have talked about it. We talked about it on our own shows. We've talked about it on other people's shows. We've talked about it in text. We've talked about it in Slack, but we haven't talked about it a whole lot, at least on this show. And I keep getting asked about it. Why does it not happen more? So let's do that as part of next week's show. Uh, Joe, we'll talk in a week. Uh, safe travels home. Go baseball. Go baseball. All right. This has been the FSS Plus Podcast. We'll talk next week. So just chill to the next episode.